In this video, we will be discussing cell division. Cell division is one of the key aspects of living organisms that distinguishes them from non-living matter. And cell division allows organisms to produce more of their own kind. And it is also considered to be the main contributor to the continuity of life. In single-celled organisms, division of one cell reproduces the entire organism. But multicellular organisms, particularly eukaryotes, depend on cell division for three different purposes. Development from a fertilized cell, growth, and repair. Cell division by itself is a major part of what's called the cell cycle, which is the process during which cells typically divide. It includes a number of other uh, activities besides the cell dividing. Here are some uh, diagrams or pictures of cell division. This would be a single-celled amoeba dividing into two amoeba. This is a fertilized egg developing during development and after fertilization. And this is a couple of cells to, or one cell dividing into more cells inside of a human body. <clears throat> Most cell division results in genetically identical daughter cells. We call the cells that are produced by cell division daughter cells. The one exception to this is a type of cell division known as meiosis. And this is a special type of cell division that produces the gametes, sperm and egg cells. And we'll get to this in a later chapter. Now, in order for a cell to divide, we need to, or in order to understand cell division, we need to understand how the genetic material is organized. We already know that all the DNA in a cell constitutes the cell's genome. And depending on the kind of cell, a genome can be one DNA molecule or can be a bunch of different DNA molecules. The DNA molecules themselves are packaged into chromosomes. Eukaryotic chromosomes consist of chromatin, and we've talked about this a little bit before, and it's, chromatin is basically a complex of DNA wrapped around proteins. Um, we can also distinguish the two different kinds of cells that undergo cell division, and this is based also upon the numbers of chromosomes. Somatic cells, which are the cells found throughout a body, for an organism, for instance, in a human, it's all the body cells that are not reproductive. These cells have two sets of chromosomes. By contrast, the gametes, which are the reproductive cells, have only one set of chromosomes. <coughs> the distribution of chromosomes during cell division is a very, very important um, aspect of how cell division works. So in preparation for cell division, the DNA is replicated and the chromosomes are going to condense. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Each duplicated chromosome consists of two sister chromatids, and these are copies of the original chromosome that are attached together. They are attached by a structure called the centromere. Here's a picture of two sister chromatids. You can see that these, each one of these is the sister chromatid, and then right here in the middle is the centromere. The centromere is basically like a protein waistband that holds the chromatids together. <clears throat> During cell division, the chromatids are going to separate and move into two nuclei. And once they are separated, we now will refer to them again as chromosomes. Here's, a, here's an example of that. So here's one chromosome in a cell. It's going to be duplicated and form sister chromatids. And then when that cell divides, we then have one of the chromosomes. Now, typically there would be two chromosomes here, and therefore two pairs of sister chromatids. And that's what we would see after cell division. Eukaryotic cell division consists of mitosis, which is the division of the nucleus, or the genetic material, and then cytokinesis, which is the division of the cytoplasm, or the rest of the cells. Okay. As we've already mentioned before, gametes are produced by meiosis, and then somatic cells are produced by mitosis. One of the differences between meiosis and mitosis is that in meiosis, the daughter cells are not identical uh, genetically to the parent cell, and they also have half as many chromosomes. We're going to spend more time on that in a later chapter. So in the cell cycle, there are two distinct sets of events, the mitotic phase and interphase. And the German anatomist Walter Fleming is the person who's credited with figuring this out initially. And he used different dyes that stained chromosomes so he could see them. <coughs> what was determined was that the cell cycle consists of the mitotic phase, which is mitosis and cytokinesis, and interphase, which 
during which cell growth and copying of the chromosomes occurs in preparation for the cell division part or the mitotic phase. Interphase, which is a majority of the cell cycle, is divided into three subphases the G1 phase, the S phase, and the G2 phase. During the, both of the G phases, the cell grows, protein synthesis occurs, um, organelles are duplicated, things like that. In the S phase, which is named for its main process, it's called the synthesis phase, and this is the phase during which all of the chromosomes are duplicated, or put another way, DNA is synthesized in order to duplicate all of the genome. If we, put the, if we put the cell cycle on a clock, here's what it would look like. G1 is the first phase. It lasts a considerable amount of time. Then comes the S phase, then the G2 phase, and this all makes up interphase. Then we get to the mitotic phase, which includes mitosis and cytokinesis. Now, we've already talked about the chromosomes getting divided up during mitosis. The structure that carries that function out is called the mitotic spindle, and it's a structure that's made up of microtubules. Think of it like, a, uh, like when you go fishing. You have a fishing pole and a reel. That would be the mitotic spindle, and then the chromosomes would be the fish. Now, in, in animal cells, the assembly of the microtubules begins in what's called the centrosome, which, as we recall, contains centrioles, and that entire structure is what is um, responsible for moving chromosomes around. And that produces the microtubules that are going to attach to the chromosomes and manipulate them. During prometaphase, which is one of the phases of mitosis that we'll get to in a minute, the spindle microtubules were going to attach to parts of the chromosomes called the kinetochores, and this allows them to move around. We'll see this again here in a minute. And then in metaphase, the chromosomes are all lined up on the metaphase plate. So this is just kind of a preview of what's going to happen in mitosis. Remember that all movement of the chromosomes is based on the microtubules that are part of the centrosome and the centriole. All taken together, we would call that structure the mitotic spindle. So here we are looking at mito the different phases of mitosis. So we'll start with the end of interphase. And keep in mind, interphase is not part of mitosis. It's part of the cell cycle, but it's not part of mitosis. So at this point in interphase, all of the chromosomes have been duplicated. But notice that you can't distinguish them. That is because they have not condensed yet. When the cell enters the first stage of mitosis, which is called prophase, a couple of things happen. First of all, the chromosomes condense, or the chromatin condenses, into visible chromosomes. Notice that there are two sister chromatids for each chromosome. We can distinguish the different chromosomes based on their size. The other thing that happens is the early mitotic spindle begins to form, and the centrosomes begin to migrate toward opposite ends of the cell. The next phase is prometaphase. During this phase, the nuclear envelope begins to break down, that's in order to release the chromosomes. And then the microtubules, which are part of, or some of the microtubules, which are part of the spindle, attach to the centromere of the different sets of sister chromatids. The middle phase of mitosis is metaphase, and it's fairly simple. All that happens here is the microtubules line the sister chromatid pairs along the equator of the cell. We call this area the metaphase plate. Now, it's not really a plate. It's just a location. It's not a structure. Once that happens, then anaphase begins. And this is where all of the sister chromatids are separated from each other by the microtubules. This is kind of like reeling in a fish if you catch a fish when you go fishing. And then the last phase of mitosis is telophase. And that's where the nuclear membrane begins to reform. And all of the chromosomes are at opposite ends of the cell and we start to see cytokinesis begin. And then during telophase, cytokinesis begins, and then it, when cytokinesis completes, the entire process is over. Here's some more uh, pictures of the mitotic spindle. You can see the, the uh, microtubules here. You can see the centrosome containing the centrioles. You can see how everything is involved with moving the chromosomes around. Now, in cytokinesis, there are a couple things that happen depending on the type of cell. In animal cells, cytokinesis occurs by a process known as cleavage. In plant cells, what happens is a cell plate forms rather than a cleavage furrow as we see in animal cells. If we look at a diagram of that, we can see this cleavage furrow forming. Okay, It's kind of like draw, pulling a drawstring together on a balloon. However, in plant cells, 
vesicles that contain cellulose begin to form along the metaphase plate here. And so the division really occurs from the inside out, whereas the division in animal cells occurs from the outside in. Single-celled prokaryotes go through a much simpler process called binary fission. And it essentially consists of two steps. The chromosome replicates and the cell divides into two. It's as simple as that. We can see that here. Here's a bacterial cell. It's duplicated its chromosome. The chromosomes, the copied chromosomes begin to move apart from each other. The cell begins to divide and you get two daughter cells and that's it. It's fairly simple. Now, just as in metabolism, the cell cycle must be regulated because you, your body can't just have cells going crazy and dividing all the time. So there's a lot of different regulation at the molecular level. And we call this the cell cycle control system. The cells that escape these usual, usual controls are called cancer cells. There's a number of ways in which the eukaryotic cell cycle is regulated, and we're not going to get into too much detail on it. Essentially, one of the primary systems is what's called the cell cycle control system, which is like a clock. And at specific times throughout the cell cycle, there are checkpoints where the cell neither needs a stop signal or a go-ahead signal. And these could be provided by hormones or intracellular proteins or, you know, any other sort of, of extracellular signaling. Here's what that system looks like. There's a G1 checkpoint that should a cell not need to divide, the cell will be stopped right there. If the cell is going to divide, then this stop sign will be lifted and the cell will continue all the way through until it gets to the G2 checkpoint at the end of G2. The cell will continue, that checkpoint will say go, and it goes through mitosis and the cell divides. At any one of these three places, the cell can be told to stop dividing or to go ahead and finish dividing. Now, for cells that do not have a normal cell cycle control system, they divide uncontrollably, and we call these cancer cells. Now, cancer cells divide without needing any sort of external signal, such as a hormone or growth factor or internal signal. So they typically have an abnormal cell cycle control system. Now, one thing to clarify here, they don't grow out of control necessarily, meaning they don't necessarily get bigger, but they divide out of control. So they gain in number. Normal cells can be converted to cancerous cells by a process called transformation. Typically, the immune system will get rid of cancer cells, but those that are not gotten rid of are going to form tumors. And there are a couple types of tumors. If the, nor, if the abnormal cells stay at the original tumor site, those are called benign. That means they do not spread, and they typically don't cause serious forms of cancer. Malignant tumors, on the other hand, can invade surrounding tissues and spread through a process called metastasis. So if, a, if cancer is metastasizing, that means it's spreading to other parts of the body. This is a more serious form of cancer because it can often get to places where you know doctors don't know where it is and it can do significant harm to people. And there are a number of different therapies that treat metastatic cancers, chemotherapy being one of them, where a person takes drugs that stop cell division. Here's what that would look like if a person had a cancer cell, in this case breast cancer. Here's a tumor that starts from a single cancer cell. It may grow, and or the tumor may grow and make more cells getting bigger and bigger, and ultimately it may metastasize by sending cells out into the blood system, through the blood vessels or the lymph system, and it can spread to any other parts of the body. That's why malignant cancers can be particularly dangerous.